thank you very much. It's an honor to be invited by such a great organization. I enjoyed seeing the Roosevelts uh, a couple of weeks ago. I learned a whole lot more about, you know, a little bit of the history and that great family too. So, uh, so with that, what I want to do is uh, just give you a broad overview of what I want to talk about. Um, I think I was invited to give this talk because I was giving a, a webinar uh, maybe a year or so ago talking about some of the results of our climate change research. Um, and one of the things that we found once we finished that research is that we cannot study climate change in isolation. And uh, Dr. Andreessen's talk gave a wonderful insight into that. So uh, what I wanted to do today was try to put the stress of climate change in the context of some of the other stressors, focusing on Lake Michigan as a whole, but mostly on the fisheries in Lake Michigan. So our, our climate change team was a broad one, and this is research that is finished up, and I want to acknowledge uh, uh, colleagues from our lab in Ann Arbor, Chuck Medengen and David Warner, uh, Brent Lofgren, who was mentioned in the last talk as a climatologist. He was the one that developed some forecasts for our uh, what the climate may look like in Lake Michigan itself. Uh, from NOAA, uh, some talented scientists at the University of Michigan, Paris Collingsworth and Yu Chun Kao, uh, a colleague from Michigan Department of Natural Resources, Randy Claremont, and Mike Murray from the National Wildlife Federation. So if you lose me, I want to hit you with take-home messages twice. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to hit you at the beginning. This is not news, but Lake Michigan has endured many human-induced stressors over the past, and I'll just put it at 150 years. And up to now, this is the sort of the punchline from my talk, is that it's really hard to pull out climate and say, this is how climate is really important and what we've looked at in the past. Because all of these other things that have been happening in Lake Michigan have overwhelmed that climate signal. Um, and so, as a result, again, what I just said, we can't just study climate effects on uh, biotic or living things like fish and isolation. Uh, with that said, I, I think there's every reason to think that climate change could be much more important in the future uh, as a driver in the system than we understand it to be now. And I'll talk, and I'll, I'll, I'll hit that again at the end. All right, so what I study is almost, is kind of the, what we call the food web. So many of you may remember sort of the trophic chain uh, where you think of, and so the difference between a trophic chain and a food web is just that it's, there's more arrows. So think about this as a trophic chain, or at the top you have like the salmon and trout. Let's see if I can use this. Uh, it's not gonna show up. So you have the salmon and the trout at the top. You have the forage fish at the bottom, things like alewife, smelt, some of our native uh, species like chubs and sculpins. And those that in turn feed upon invertebrates, Right, so invertebrates that live on the bottom, invertebrates zooplankton that live in the water column, microscopic animals, and then finally at the base we have algae. Right, we have, now we have benthic algae because the, the water is becoming more clear, and we also have phytoplankton or algae that live in the water column. And the algae, of course, is fed by our, our primary limiting nutrient of phosphorus, and of course it also needs sunlight. So this is kind of the, the world in which we live in uh, more and more as fishery scientists is, is not understanding fish just for fish themselves, but also thinking about the predators of fish and the food that's available to fish and ultimately all these different arrows and components of the food web. So what are the big drivers in the Lake Michigan food web now over the past 150 years? And so I'm going to speak to the first four of these, maybe the first third or half of the talk, and then we'll shift into what evidence we have that climate change could be a driver in some of these food web changes. So the first is changes in physical habitat. So if we think about what we did 150 years ago uh, in terms of going logging uh, along our streams and rivers in particular, of course we had logging outside of the watershed as well, but the impact that those logs had on, um, you know, so, so they would cut down the logs, uh, let them drift then down into tributary, down to the sawmill. So that had effects on the temperature of the water, had effects on the substrate, we had erosion and siltation, and that affected fish from a, from a, mostly from a concept of spawning habitat. A lot of our fish in the Great Lakes go up into the rivers to spawn. So this was a big change uh, for a lot of fish. The second thing we did, of course, is we built all kinds of dams. And we have dams, as shown here on, on your right, um, 
this is a, a database of where all the dams are in Michigan. And I think maybe your speaker last night, you learned a little bit about the removal of these dams. And this is happening more and more now because a lot of these dams are really old and it costs a lot to maintain dams. Um, so this is really, and, and I didn't see the talk, but I mean, the thing we think about as fishery scientists is on the one hand, it's great to remove dams because it exposes the upstream habitat for native fishes. The negative effect, potentially, is that it also allows for a lot more spawning habitat for sea land prey. Oh. Um, so this is kind of the trade-off where we're struggling with dams, and there's gonna, we're going to hear a lot more about dam removal and upkeep of dams in the future. Um, so that's the first big driver in the food, these physical changes that humans have caused. The second one is what we've done as fish, not we, but what the fishery managers have done. Um, and I'll give you just two brief examples in terms of overfishing and in terms of stocking. So I think it's really, if we were to put ourselves back, you know, 100, 150 years ago, and we were to stand at the precipice of any of the Great Lakes and look out, nobody, no human probably had the concept that we could go out and harvest more fish than that than the lake could produce. This wasn't a concept, I think, a human concept at that time. But overfishing was possible in the oceans, or in a system like Lake Michigan, for example. We learned the hard way that that's definitely not true. And we, we have done this over and over again and continue to, to face this. Uh, so this is a picture of, of whitefish being harvested. Lake Michigan was blessed, I think, with this amazing flock of uh, cisco species, deep water ciscos. So you think about, you hear the stories of Darwin's finches you know, in the Galapagos Islands. And all of these finches have these unique niches in which they could fit within the food web uh, of those islands, different sized peaks, they would eat different prey. We had not quite that dramatic, but we had this group of deep water ciscos in Lake Michigan um, that used to exist and they all spawned at different times. Uh, they all uh, ate a little bit different food. They had different gill raker sizes and they had evolved into these unique uh, spots within the food web. Today, we just have one of those, the smallest one left, that's Corrigonus hoyi, that's what we call bloater, or you might know as chub or smoked chub. The other five, the larger ones, were all overfished by the 1960s. So again, a big loss for the ecosystem. Another species that has been affected, this beautiful image by Andrew Muir from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, was lake trout. Lake trout was our native top predator, our native fish-eating fish. -eating fish. Um, and it was decimated by overfishing as well as sea land prey. And I'll get to sea land prey in just a minute. So when we were able, when the managers were then able to control sea land prey, um, beginning in the 1960s, that allowed for the states to successfully be, uh, stock uh, some of these large predators back into the lake. So this is a plot of stocking that's gone on since 1965, and there was many, many stocking events before the 1960s as well, but these began to take and be successful. Um, and we stocked all kinds of species. Of, of course, how many of these are native? Lake trout. Lake trout. Lake trout. We got the native lake trout in there. That's an, that's an orange. The rest are not native, um, but they all, they, they were all effective in reducing the amount of, we had a super abundant numbers of prey fish out there. So this has really been an effective program in terms of taking advantage of the resources that were available um, in terms of all of the prey fish, because there were no more top predators in the system in the 1960s. All right, so let's briefly then talk about nutrient inputs. So think back, so we're kind of jumping all over the food web. Talk to the top, stocked fish, going down to the bottom, what about nutrient inputs? Um, so phosphorus trends are the first one. Phosphorus inputs is what we'll talk about first, and that's shown here. So this is how much phosphorus is going into the lake um, through tributaries. And you see that we have seen long-term declines in Lake Michigan, with the biggest drop being from the 70s to the 80s. So we signed the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, 1973 or 72, Judy? 72. Um, which mostly reduced, uh, whose biggest impact was reducing phosphorus in detergents used in dishwashers, or sorry, not dishwashers, but washing machines. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen this long-term decline with less phosphorus, so you're, you have less of the limiting nutrient for algae. So that's kind of the underlying <coughs> background, is that there's less phosphorus in the lake. 
If we look at the phosphorus measured in the middle of the lake, which I'm showing you here in blue, um, again by EPA, we've seen a dramatic drop, not in the 70s to 80s, but a big drop from the 90s to the 2000s. So much lower levels of phosphorus out in the middle of the lake in the 2000s than we saw uh, back in the 90s or back in the 80s. Okay. Invasive species. So in my opinion, th this is the biggest driver, single biggest driver in Lake Michigan, or in most of the Great Lakes, except <coughs> for Lake Superior, which has been, to a large extent, immune from a lot of the uh, effects of invasive species. So invasive you, can be defined as essentially something that's non-indigenous and also has probably widespread negative ecological or human impacts on a system. So things that are largely considered invasive um, would be something like the sea lamprey, alewife, uh, although alewife certainly do serve positive ecosystem functions uh, in, in many regards, zebra and quagga mussels, and even things like Pithotrephes and Circopagus, things maybe you haven't heard of, these are water fleas that eat other uh, native zooplankton in the water column. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of sort of background on three of these. So the first is sea lamprey. Um, so like the, like the, so what you're seeing here is the mouth of a sea lamprey as they are spawning, at their spawning or adult stage. When they become parasitic, and they're essentially looking for the largest fish they can find to attach and feed upon. Um, and so they're native to the Atlantic, moved above um, uh, Niagara Falls with construction of the Welland Canal, and they had a fundamentally large impact on our ecosystem by depleting uh, or causing full or partial responsibility for the collapse of lake trout, as we talked about, burbot. So burbot is actually a native freshwater cod that we have in the Great Lakes. Um, Burbot essentially were almost wiped out by sea lamprey. And Lake Whitefish. Lake Whitefish would not have recovered to the levels they have today if not for the control of sea lamprey. So today our primary um, management technique is going out and treating lamprey in, in the tributaries where they live for two to 17 years with a, with a, um, with a chemical that kills the larvae of these lamprey. And now the adults are at like 10% of what they used to be back in the 1960s. So many fewer sea lamprey than we have today. Alewife came from the same place in the Atlantic. Um, this, what I'm showing you here is uh, with the lack of top predators, because sea lamprey had come in, wiped out all the top predators. We had all of this alewife biomass in the 1960s. Um, in terms of prey fish, and there were so many die-offs by 1967, they were on the cover of Time magazine. <laughs> so um, again, just a, a, a historic image of massive amounts of alewife that had overeaten, they had overshot their carrying capacity because there was no predators to keep them in check, okay? So alewife are still with us today in Lake Michigan, um, but they also, so, so they're viewed uh, in some camps, if you will, as a very positive, as, as on net, a positive thing to have in the ecosystem because they feed the Chinook salmon fishery. Mm. Chinook salmon uh, diet studies show well over 90%, 95% of Chinook salmon diets are comprised of alewife. And Chinook salmon are, are really one of the uh, main reasons that a lot of people like to go fishing in Lake Michigan. But they have, a, alewife have negative effects too. They cause low vitamin B in the eggs of lake trout. So if I were to, uh, if I were to go out and eat uh, an alewife, I would get high levels of thiaminase. And thiaminase breaks down thiamine or vitamin B. And that's what happens to lake trout or to Chinook salmon as it turns out. And so you, they end up having very low survivability of their eggs because they're eating alewife. Alewife, as adults, like shown here, also have a propensity to eat baby native species. Mm -hmm. So they eat baby emerald shiners that used to be really abundant in Lake Michigan. They eat baby burbot, walleye, lake trout, and there are other hypotheses that maybe they're um, also having a negative effect on other species through predation. <coughs> and so what I'm showing you here is a, a time series from our lab of alewife biomass in Lake Michigan dating back to 1962. And you can see that huge buildup of alewife biomass and then that long-term decline. And that is, again, thinking back to that stocking. So 
If I were to superimpose the stocking graph here, we would see as the stocking biomass returning the top predators of the system, they brought a wipe down back in check. And now they're at such low levels that we're seeing um, um, further and further reductions in stocking of Chinook salmon, in part because of concern that alewife are going to collapse in Lake Michigan, such as they did in Lake Huron just 10 years ago. So, um, shifting gears, zebra and quagga mussels. So, zebra mussels came here first. Um, they were limited to depths about 100 feet or less. So, in our big, deep Great Lakes, that's not a lot of habitat. They were just kind of thinking about the ring around the bathtub. That's really what they were doing. Um, having impacts, yes. Uh, nobody likes to step at, on a zebra mussel on the beach, for sure. But in terms of wholesale ecosystem effects, we didn't really know what was coming. What was coming was the quagga mussel um, about 10 or so years later. So quagga mussels is there on, on your left, not the zebra striping. It can go um, as deep as, uh, as the lake offers. So far, they're still getting deeper and deeper. And now they have completely, the lake has switched. There are no more zebra mussels anymore. It's all quagga mussels. Um, so what these animals do is they live on the bottom. They have a siphon. Um, so other native invertebrates that live on the bottom of the lake um, don't have this siphon shooting up that they can then collect that algae as it's filtering down to them um, as easily. And this is, so there's some potential that these quagga mussels are out competing some of the native uh, bugs that live on the bottom. So what are some of the other effects? Well, remember, they're filtering out the water, and what they really love to eat is this algae that drifts down. And we've seen huge declines in, uh, like, 40% declines since 1998 in the amount of algae out in Lake Michigan. So part of this is attributed to that long-term decline I talked about in phosphorus, as we've been since the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. But part of it also is attributed to filtering uh, by these mussels out of, of phytoplankton. So the other thing that they've had an impact on, so here's a map of quagga mussels as they've spread, first found in 1998, up around, right around where we are, and now look at them in 2005. If you could see a map in 2010, it would be just all black. They're, they're everywhere. Um, and the mirror image of that is the hot dog for fish, dipariah. So I don't know, has anybody heard of dipariah before? Very good. So, so dipariah, they're like, almost like a pill bug. Uh, that your kids might, or your grandkids might like to play with. Live on the bottom of the lake, high energy density, high for lipids, and all kinds of fish love to eat that variety. But fish, very few fish have adapted to be able to eat these quagga mussels. So, what does it look like out there? Uh, this is a video just to orient you. Um, so we have a camera. Have you heard about these GoPro cameras? Very yes. cool, right? So we put a GoPro camera as deep as we could get it, which is about 55 meters, 180 feet, in the mouth of our bottom trawl net. So the, the camera is kind of looking out. You can see the wings, see the right wing of our trawl um, here. This is our destructive door. So we have to use these big doors to get the, get the um, trawl on the bottom. And then the, essentially we're moving, you know, the boat is somewhere over here and we're moving the, the bottom trawl this way. So this is our survey that's been going on since 1973. But what I want you to see is look at that carpet of mussels out there. Um, it is incredible, you know, and that used to be all sand and native invertebrates, and today it's quagga mussels. All right, so just to try to summarize then, sort of again, trying to take a 30,000 foot view of what's going on in Lake Michigan. Uh, at the top of the food web, here's that plot of, you can't see that very well. Can we dim the lights at all? Oh, yeah, which we want to see. Yeah, it's all Is that, is that all right? Yeah. Okay, so we had this buildup again of, of all the salmon, right? And, and that was, and trout, and that was due to uh, stocking successful because we had controlled those sea lamp, right? Uh, at the bottom of the food web, we've been getting cleaner. So at the top of the food web, we're adding biomass. At the bottom of the food web, we are uh, putting less phosphorus in the lake, and we're seeing less phosphorus measured in the lake uh, because of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. 
but at the same time we have these invasive species that are really mixing up how energy moves throughout the lake. And to a large extent, a lot of that energy is being sequestered down in the bottom, where it used to be up in the water column. So things like Dreissena mussels, things like round goby that I haven't talked about today, uh, very abundant uh, non-native fish that eats Dreissena mussels. So yeah, I don't know. I think if we're going to have mussels, gobies are probably a good thing because it brings that energy back into the food web that otherwise was just sitting there on the bottom of the lake. Um, so it's very dynamic, it's very complex, and it's hard to understand. Okay. So to try to figure out what's been going on since the 1998, uh, we looked at, we tried to pull together all the trends from all the Great Lakes, and briefly I'm just going to give you what we found for Lake Michigan. So we looked at, again, phosphorus up to, uh, up to as low as phosphorus, up to piscivores, and said, what are the trends since 1998? And we found that there were, for mo many of these time series, there were trends. We saw that the water is clearer than it used to be. That the, m the numbers of uh, biomass of piscivores out there, so this is all the species of salmon, all the species, and our, our native lake trout. That biomass has actually gone up since 1998. Uh, we've seen negative levels of phosphorus in the lake. We've seen l less algae in the lake. We've seen fewer benthic, native benthic invertebrates, and we've seen declines in prey fish. One thing we, I don't have on here is, of course, uh, our Dreissenian mussels, and those have gone up. We just didn't have the data, uh, the kinds of data that we needed for this particular analysis. So as ecologists, uh, this may be completely boring to you, but we like to think of things as sort of, what's causing these trends, right? Why are we seeing things going up and down? We, tend to think about things and maybe oversimplify things, and then I'll, I'll, I'm going to oversimplify them for you. We think about two primary forces, a top-down force, like predation is, is causing everything, and a bottom-up force. So a top-down force says, for building up salmon and trout, that leads to fewer prey fish. We have fewer prey fish, then the things that prey fish eat can go up in abundance, and if we're having more zooplankton and benthic invertebrates, then we have less algae. Right? So this is sort of a, what's called a trophic cascade in ecology. The flip side of this is if, no, no, it's all bottom up. So that is, if you start at the bottom of the food web and think about phosphorus, and in the case of Lake Michigan, there's less phosphorus, um, that's going to have an effect up the food chain. So you're shrinking the base of the food chain. So you have, because you have less phosphorus, well, you have less algae, you have less zooplankton, <coughs> yada, 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 right? So, this could be the tension of, of factors that are going on in Lake Michigan. So what we did in a very simplistic way is try to see what <coughs> evidence is there in Lake Michigan that things are all top down or what evidence is that no, it's more bottom up. And to do that, we can plot a, adjacent trophic levels and see if the trends are going this way or the trends are going that way. And briefly, we, we found evidence for both. So if we look for algae, <laughs> we see a positive trend since 1998 for algae. That's suggestive of, yeah, that algae is reduced, is, is, is being limited by the phosphorus. At the same time, we can flip it and say, well, wait a minute. Uh, again, here's where we don't have a, a lot of great data on Dreissenids, as it turns out. We have three years since 1998, but it's, it's a negative trend, suggesting that it's also top down on algae, right? For zooplankton, some evidence that it's more bottom up. Um, for prey fish, uh, no significant trend between bottom up, uh, no significant evidence that it's, uh, when we think about zooplankton, that prey fish are limited by food. But if we look at uh, benthic invertebrates, native benthic invertebrates in particular, some evidence that, yeah, there could be food limitation on prey fish. But prey fish, again, are getting hit both ways. If we plot salmon and trout as a function of prey fish, clearly top down. Uh, years in which there's more salmon and trout are years in which we have fewer prey fish. So in general, both of these factors, again, a very dynamic system. We have bottom-up forces. We have top-down forces operating in Lake Michigan. Um, and it's a, it makes it a, a fun place to do, to, to do research. <laughs> uh, a tough place to be a manager, though. All right. So big background, but I think it's important to kind of set the stage for, all right, now we have this new layer of a human-induced stressor, right? A previous speaker did a nice job of talking about climate change, the trends, and also the variability. And so what we set out to do in a project was try to see what can we pull out of our fisheries data 
that tells us that climate is important. And so again, fisheries are a key economic drive in the Great Lakes. Um, if you look at people who study the direct spending on that, and it's a big number, over $2 billion. And then if you do the multiplicative impact of that fisheries spending, you get huge numbers that are almost hard to believe, $7 billion throughout the Great Lakes. So what we tried to do is ask, how might we see evidence of climate uh, affecting fish sort of through a mechanistic effect? So let's give an example of one that we didn't come up with that was published 20 years ago, um, where it was able to link ice cover uh, to all the way to the Lake Whitefish fishery. So the idea being uh, ice is actually a good thing. Having ice in the winter helps little whitefish eggs that are incubating over the winter below, uh, the, below the ice. So that ice acts as an insulator, protects from wave action and wind action. So um, that's a direct link then to a link then to ice all the way to how many lake whitefish show up to the commercial fishery and might show up for dinner tonight, right? So that's a, that's a way that we can link climate to uh, a fishery management uh, link or uh, effect. And so we thought about other ways. Well, what about warming temperatures? This is a sort of a, a universal, not controversial expectation. What effects might warming temperature have on the, on the metabolic rate of the fish that can then influence the, how fast fish grow? Um, what about water levels? Are they going to, and uh, Dr. Andreessen did a really nice job of laying out the controversy, not controversy, but for scientists maybe controversy, It'll make it a little exciting. Um, it, are lakes going to actually be lower water levels or not? Um, the scientists on our project is, is of the camp that it's not, it's, it, you, it's probably more likely that uh, water levels are going to be about the same based on available data. But if water levels do, in fact, you can imagine a scenario where all these fish that spawn in the near shore zone or in the tributaries, they could be negatively impacted by lower water levels because they could have lower spawning habitat quality. And then lastly, in terms of stratification of the lake, and I'll get into this in just a little bit more, but the lake, in the summer, it becomes almost two lakes, a warm lake on top with a warm layer and a, a cold lake on the bottom. And that can affect habitat for that fish and uh, food availability for that fish. And if we're stratifying the lake earlier and we have a longer stratification period, it could have consequences for growth. All right, so we, we looked backwards, first of all. Um, so we looked at our historical data, tried to pull out a, 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 um, evidence for a climate signal. I'll give you some data on that. Then we looked forward. We, we worked with our NOAA uh, partner to develop localized climate predictions for the Great Lakes, including Lake Michigan. And then our overall goal was to take that climate prediction and then forecast what effect that would have on what we call recruitment of fish or on fish growth. Okay, so I'll tell you how we did. So in terms of looking backwards, this was led by Paris Collingsworth, who was a postdoctoral scientist with me at the time. He's now with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and also liaisons quite a bit with uh, EPA in Chicago. Paris is pictured here with his daughter. And so I'm gonna talk about a term called recruitment, which is not intuitive, unless maybe you're a big sports fan and you pay attention to who the recruits are for your basketball team or your football team every year. In a, in a biological sense, recruitment is the number of fish, baby fish that survive uh, to make it, we'll just call it to age one. So um, some years you get a lot of recruits and some years you get very, very few recruits. And uh, as scientists, we're trying to figure out what causes that huge variability in the number of recruits. Does that make sense? Okay. So in particular, we're interested in prey fish because prey fish, of course, support these valuable recreational uh, salmon and trout <coughs> fisheries. And there also are commercial fisheries for uh, these prey fish. There no longer is a commercial fishery for alewife, uh, but there, is a commercial there are commercial fisheries for rainbow smelt and for bloater, for chub. And so prey fish have been declining in Lake Michigan. And this is the... Um, yeah, you all can still see this really well. So we've been going out since 1973, our lab, and these are the sites that, we're, that we hit every fall. I don't know if you've ever seen our research vessels if you live near these towns, but in September, October, you see the research vessel grayling. 
or now the research vessel Arcticus in your town, this is what we're doing. We're updating this survey. And you can <laughs> see, um, so you can see what's happened, right? On the, on the right hand side, we have record low numbers of prey fish out there in the Great Lakes, driven in large part by uh, the blue there, that's bloater, that's that native going back to that flock of unique deep water ciscos we talked about, the smallest one that's left, that's the bloater. Used to be really abundant in the 80s, not so much anymore. Um, so our question was what role is climate playing in that long-term time series going back to 73? So we did this first for alewife, and we thought about three climate variables that can be important. Um, uh, water temperature, so with the idea that uh, the warmer water temperature is actually going to be a benefit because those larvae can grow more, more quickly and be a larger size before winter sets in. And also by growing to a larger size, they're outgrowing potential uh, predators, maybe. Winter, uh, evidence from Lake Ontario that really cold winters can lead to poor survival of alewife. Thirdly, water level, the idea that being years in which the water level is higher, we might see more recruits because there's better access to spawning habitat <coughs> for those adults. But we also have to think about things beyond climate, things like predators of alewife. So we also put salmon biomass in the model. So to just jump straight to the results, um, all you need to look at is the height of the bar. The higher the bar, that means the more important it was in terms of an explanatory variable. So the climate variables are all on, the, on your right. Salmon uh, is on the left. For Lake Michigan, salmon overwhelmed everything else. We couldn't, we couldn't detect any effect of those three climate variables. Salmon drove alewife. Um, in Lake Huron, our model really was not that good. Some evidence that, if, that so Lake Huron's in red, some evidence that higher, higher water level years is better, but um, we aren't sure if that's a st statistical artifact or not. So how about bloater? Again, this is that chub uh, native species. The only climate variable we could come up with that might affect uh, climate variable mm -hmm. or might affect recruitment of bloater, and bloater is a fish that lives way out in the middle of the lake on the bottom. And if you're going to find a, a place of relative uh, climate constancy, it's going to be that place. Uh, there's just not a lot of variability in the middle of the lake uh, down deep. But uh, the idea was that the warmer the winter and spring was, the faster those eggs that are overwintering uh, would incubate. So they'd be vulnerable to uh, a shorter period of time to, to things that eat eggs. And there's some animals out there that eat eggs. But we also had to think about some factors beyond climate, such as those alewife that might be eating baby bloater. Uh, the sex ratio of bloaters, really strangely, they can be get like 95% female during some years. Other years, they're more balanced, like 50%, 50-50. And then lastly, adult conditions. So the idea that being at uh, years in which bloater are, uh, have higher lipids, they're fatter, they can produce happier and healthier offspring. <coughs> And so when we look at the bloater story, um, again, different factors showing up. Well, well the first thing is we saw, we saw consistent drivers between the two lakes. Sex ratio, more balanced sex ratio produced stronger recruits. Fish that were in stronger condition, tended higher condition produced uh, more, uh, more offspring. Alewife had a negative effect in both lakes. We're not sure yet if that's uh, spurious or if that's real. But our climate variable, Nothing. Again, we couldn't pull out that climate variable for bloater. So looking backwards uh, for these two time series and two lakes, we couldn't pull out the uh, effect and the importance of climate. Um, alewife, it was dominated by salmon. Um, and for bloater, we found uh, several different factors. Uh, again, no evidence for climate. So we weren't able then to take, our original intent was to forecast how many recruits of bloater or alewife might we see in coming decades owing to climate, and we can't do that because we can't pull out a climate signal as we look backwards. <coughs> all right, so what about looking forward then? Um, so first of all, we developed these localized climate projections, and this is what Brent Lofgren at NOAA uh, did. And I'm not gonna go into this because of the previous talk, but in general, the predictions were warmer temperatures. So, so Brent didn't just project predict air temperature, but also water temperature down into the depths of the lake. And so what he found, what he predicted was that 
Um, by 2043 to 2070, uh, two to three degrees C warmer water temperatures throughout the water column, um, especially in summer and fall. So these are, these are significant <coughs> increases. Uh, in terms of precipitation, uh, in general, wetter uh, in the winter seemed to be most of the increased precipitation was lake effect. In the summer, really no spatial pattern to where it was going to be wetter, uh, but in general, a little bit more rain. And then ice cover, again, thinking back to that Lake Whitefish example, far less ice 2043 to 2070 than we see today, and a steep north to south gradient. So almost no, like in the southern Lake Michigan, no ice at all. Some uh, thinner ice in northern Lake Michigan. So what does this mean for fish? Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about how, what that lake looks like if we look at like a cross section of it. So what you're seeing is a cross section of the lake in February. So on the top, you've got that layer of ice. Potentially, this is like what it might be today or what it might have been 20 or 30 years ago. And it's, it's, the lake is all pretty much the same temperature and it, it's mixing. Okay. And thinking back to those mussels that now sit on the bottom of the lake, that means that those mussels have access so phytoplankton or algae that are uh, up in the water column, they, they could eventually drift down. By June, uh, of course, we're getting warmer and warmer, temper <coughs> warmer, and warmer air temperatures, and uh, the lake is beginning to become more and more stratified. So you know, we're going from blue to much warmer on the top, getting warming in the bottom. And by August, and, and many times by early July, the lake is stratified. We have almost, we have a warm layer, and we have a cool layer on the bottom, and they don't mix. Mm -hmm. So that, that algae that's in the top of the water column essentially becomes trapped at what we call the <coughs> metalimnion. And the only uh, food that something like a mussel or any other thing that lives on the bottom, um, if it can't swim up and get to it, um, you know, it's only going to have access to whatever rains down on it. And then in November, we have what's called a fall turnover event. You know, we have cooler temperatures, cools off the top layer, and eventually we get the lake turning over again. So what this <coughs> means, oh, so we get the stratification period. So if you're a fish, um, it's a little bit, you could live, you could find, in some cases, whatever temperature you wanted by regulating your depth, right? So this is what makes it a little bit more complicated to forecast fish growth is because we don't know exactly where they're going to live in that water column. I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but in future decades, Brent, a very simplification, a simplified look at Brent's model is that in February, we may have no ice, shown here. Um, by June, we could be stratified now. Uh, <coughs> and in August, we are probably going to be even warmer. That, that layer on top is going to be warmer than it used to be. And that might even be deeper, <coughs> that, that, where that top layer may be deeper than it was. Um, and then again, we're still going to get a, a turnover event in the fall. So for fish, uh, in general, fish that grow faster or survive better at warmer temperatures will be favored. So even though fish are cold-blooded uh, animals, that is, they, their metabolism is um, based on the water temperature they're in, they don't regulate that. They are just like all other animals, and then they have a, a temperature in which they have a thermal Op, like their metabolism is most efficient. So they grow best, say, at 23 degrees, like a yellow perch. So they're always going to seek out that 23 degrees, all other things being equal. And the cold water fish, those fish that may uh, prefer, let's say, 7 degree water temperatures or 9 degree water temperatures, they may have to go deeper to find that. Now, what about their prey? So we don't really know. Invertebrates are far less studied relative to fish. And we don't really know how they're going to respond to these water temperatures. Some of them do have the ability to move up and down the water column, like a mycid and a possum shrimp that we have in native fish. But obviously, uh, like a diapariah or um, a freshwater clam or an invasive mussel has less ability to respond to where they are. They're just, you know, they're less mobile, of course. And then again, thinking back on the effects of these invasive mussels, uh, climate change. It's hard to tell what effect it's going to have, but if we think about the stratification period, the longer that is, we are reducing the amount of time that mussels have access to that entire water column of algae. Um, now, at the same time, 
the muscles are going to be more uh, metabolically active if they're going to be in warmer temperatures. So that means they're going to be probably filtering out more than they would be in colder water. So how that works as a net balance, I, I don't think has been really well studied yet. So to look at uh, the effects on fish growth, uh, this was led by a PhD student, Yu Chen Kao, pictured here, um, advised by Chuck Madinjin at our lab. And they looked at, they tried to take Brent's forecasted water temperatures and predict growth from 2043 to 2070. So, uh, the, so again, to break this down a little bit, we know that temperature directly affects the physiology of the fish, their metabolic rate, um, how much food they eat, how efficiently they uh, excrete or ingest waste. Uh, but then also, what's a bit of, what is very much known is how much food there is for that fish to eat. So to figure out growth, you not only have to know temperature, but also how much food there is. And as you'll see, when they did this work, that became very evident to be important. So I talked about this, fish are cold-blooded. They live, where they live balances, trying to find that thermal optimum, but then they've also got to think about things like habitat quality. Like if you're in the central basin of Lake Erie, and there's not a lot of oxygen down the bottom in the summer, you're probably not gonna to wanna to live there. So you might have to go up into warmer waters than you want to. Um, uh, what about where food is available? You might go live in suboptimal water if you're going to be able to feed really well. Or what about where your predators are? That could influence where you want to live, what water temperatures you want to live in. So for this work, they had to assume that fish would live in their um, physiological optimum temperature if it was available. Um, it's an assumption, and there are some data out here, like this shown in uh, Clear Lake, Maine, where they could figure out they had transmitters in the fish that could tell them what temperature the fish was living relative to what the temperature was available at the surface. So you can see for these lake white fish that prefer 12 degree water. Um, in fact, they're in 12 degree water even when warmer are available. So I'm, let me jump here. So how much time? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So they did this for yellow perch and for lake trout. And um, effectively, fish, both of these fish species have more time in 2043 and 2070 for, uh, like for yellow perch, 23 degrees. That's going to be more available to them now or in the future than it is now. So that's a good thing. Uh, for lake trout, something that prefers down here, um, nine degrees, there's going to be actually more nine degree water available in the future than there is now. So if you just look at temperature, it looks like uh, these fish are going to benefit by growth. Um, but the, the other impact is how much food is there. So if we assume there's the same amount of food today, um, if we take the amount of food today, project that amount of food in the summer, that's the baseline growth rate. And, and, and what you can see is that fish do not grow above baseline in the future unless there's also more food. If there's actually less food in the future, they're going to grow more slowly <coughs> than they are today. So again, we can't think about climate change in isolation. Uh, we have to think about other things because of this complex ecosystem in which we study. So similar things for Lake Whitefish, for Rainbow Trout, for Chinook Salmon. Um, they all have the potential to grow faster and to eat more food in the future so long as there's more food available for them to eat. Okay, so again, back to the take-home messages. Um, Lake Michigan has endured many human-induced stressors. It's hard for us to pull out the effect of climate change on those. We can't understand the effects of climate change and isolation going forward as we propose to do future climate change research. And this last point, climate change may become a more important driver in coming decades than we understand it to be now. And, and I guess just to elaborate on this point, uh, what we've come to expect in my uh, short time as a Lake Michigan scientist is just to be ready to expect the unexpected. <laughs> um, climate, so climate may favor invasive species. So a study in, Lake, in California looked at 164 freshwater species and found that native species were much more vulnerable to climate change than non-native species. This is kind of scary. We already have this huge driver of invasive species in the Great Lakes. Um, again, this study has not been done in our basin. 
but does not pretend well. And the reason for that is that native species tended to be more vulnerable to uh, changes in temp temperature precipitation. They have less ability to disperse relative to some of the invasive species. And they tend to be more highly specialized, uh, whereas invasive species tend to be more generalists and tend to just be more able to adapt to changing <coughs> environments. Um, the previous speaker talked about the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So this is a long-term sort of regional climate thing that has, <coughs> that over a 30-year time period uh, changes dramatically. And they found out west that there are strong correlations between salmon and this long-term climate driver. We haven't been able to tease that out in the Great Lakes. We've looked for that. Uh, haven't been able to find it, but that doesn't mean it's not important um, because it certainly is important in other areas of the world. We also can look just to our south down uh, in Lake Erie where they found strong correlations between the amount of precipitation in the spring, uh, which in turn drives discharge in the Maumee River, and the amount of yellow perch that are recruited that particular year. And this is worked by Stu Letson at Ohio State University. So there's, this is a very complex story, and it's not just, it's not the precipitation itself that's causing yellow perch. It has to do with the phosphorus going in the lake and the turbidity and how well those baby perch can avoid predators. But again, there's a link between climate and, and perch in another part of the Great Lakes. And then again, um, just learn to expect the unexpected. So think about these three quick stories. So stocking, after 46 years, <laughs> Our native of stocking our native lake trout in Lake Michigan. We still have very little appreciable natural reproduction. At the same time, our non-native Chinook salmon stocking about the same time. Now you go out and you catch a Chinook salmon, you have a one out of two chance that that salmon was born uh, not from the hatchery, but in one of, our, one, of, one of our tributaries. I don't think this would have been the expectation 50 years ago. Zebra mussels are gone. Who would have thought that? 20 or 25 years ago, right? But I don't think anybody also could have anticipated quagga mussels and the impact they've had, their ability to go deep, their ability to have this impact on phytoplankton and algae. And then the other, to leave you not on a downer note, but on a good note, uh, we're getting all kinds of new surprises in Lake Michigan fisheries. So uh, a native whitefish called uh, lake herring or cisco People that are going out, especially in northern Lake Michigan, and trawling for uh, salmon and trout are now getting these large native artidae instead. Really cool story. Um, we have world record brown trout. These, story, these pictures are almost too hard to believe. They almost look like they're Photoshopped. <laughs> but, um, so in the Manistee River, just very close to us, off in Racine and in Milwaukee, we're getting world record, and so brown trout not native to the Great Lakes, native to Europe, Germany, all over the world, but the world records are right here in Lake Michigan. In Green Bay, where there is now a Lake Whitefish fishery under the ice. This is like the last four or five years, and this is really astounding um, and got a lot of people excited. Uh, so again, expect the unexpected in Lake Michigan. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see more clear evidence of climate change effects on fisheries in the future. So, thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Any questions? Yeah, I didn't fully understand the zebra mussel depletion. Is that because of the quagga or is it something else? Yeah, is it the quagga? Yeah. Quaggas are, can outcompete zebra mussels. Yes. Yeah. Sure. You want to pick? Or yeah. you Why don't lake trout reproduce naturally now? So the biggest factor that we think has caused lake trout to not reproduce naturally is because of alewife. So that, that double effect of alewife uh, reducing the thiamine levels in their eggs and then alewife's ability to eat any eggs that do survive and produce offspring, alewife will come and they'll eat those baby uh, lake trout. Um, there also may be that we don't have enough adults out there to get the size of an adult population that we need to sort of spur on a recovery. Uh, but I think we need only to look to Lake Huron where we've seen big increases in, in lake trout biomass since the decline of alewife uh, to sort of make us much more confident that it's the alewife that's keeping lake trout at low levels. Or from reproducing yeah. naturally, right? 
Um, my question, we didn't uh, talk about the flying silver car. And uh, we live down in southern Lake Michigan by Chicago, and, and they are coming into the lake. And what is that going to do with the food chain? So the question was about uh, what effect will uh, the silver carp or the big head carp have on the food chain if they were to come into Lake Michigan and be abundant. Uh, they're going to feed at the lower, they're going to feed on algae, they're going to feed on uh, very, very small zooplankton. So the concern is that they're going to compete with our native fishes for the, the resource which you've seen is already on the decline. Um, I think a lot of people have questions whether they can really be abundant in Lake Michigan because the resources are already very, very low. So it's, it's tough to imagine in a place like Lake Michigan itself where, where carp can really establish and become really abundant. Now in a place like Green Bay or Saginaw Bay or Western Lake Erie where there's a lot more food for those carp to eat, you can imagine that they could have a, a, a larger impact and be able to feed upon, take away uh, resources that other fish that we like to to see get those resources. So you could see an out a sort of a competition effect. But in Lake Michigan, it's I think the jury's still out on whether they, they would have a big impact. Okay. You haven't mentioned Cognophora. You know, they're, they're great yucky uh, green algae, which has really taken off for the last couple of decades, at least in the Reno Peninsula. Uh, okay, so you all are exactly explaining my point about the complexity of the Great Lakes <laughs> and the difficulty of uh, pulling out climate effects. So we've had a question about Asian carp. We just had another great question about, uh, I didn't mention Cladophora. So Cladophora is another nuisance algae. Uh, it's a benthic algae that uh, when it becomes uprooted, uh, washes off onto our beaches, fouls our beaches. And there does seem to be quite a synergism between the mussels, uh, the clearing of water, and then peeing and pooping out phosphorus that the Cladophora takes up immediately and allows Cladophora to become much more abundant than they might be otherwise. And, you know, botulism is another thing sort of wound up within that near shore food web that, you're right, I, I didn't talk about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, it's a complicated story and um, that's another complicated factor. Yeah. Judy. So, Paul, but to that very issue, a lot of times you mentioned that phosphorus um, was sort of stable, and I think you were talking about the open waters yes. because phosphorus has <coughs> caused problems in the near shore, or has that changed? So Judy's question was, uh, I showed trends of declining phosphorus um, in the open parts of the lake, and her question was, that doesn't seem to be the case in the near shore parts of the lake, and she's absolutely right. Um, there, the lake has a gradient near shore to offshore. A lot of what I talked about was sort of the offshore story. I'm getting a lot of questions about the near shore part where, you know, carp could be abundant or flood offer are abundant or where uh, the phosphorus could be trapped and, and have higher levels of abundance, especially uh, offshore of tributaries. And, and I think that is a, that's an area of focus certainly in the next five years of uh, trying to understand the near shore part of Lake Michigan much better than, than, than we understand it today. A couple more questions um, in the back. I, I wasn't clear when you said that there was an impact on the spring stormwater uh, uh, runoff on the Maumee River and the yellow perch. Was it good for the perch or bad for the perch? Okay, so the question was about the, the last couple of slides there, uh, the link between the Maumee River discharge and yellow perch. So years in which there's high discharge, we tend to produce stronger yellow perch year classes. And so uh, Stu Lutz's research has shown that um, the reason for that is that, and so we, there were two mechanisms. It could have been that the, the high runoff grows a lot of algae, grows a lot of zooplankton, so those yellow perch have a lot to eat. So that could be one reason it's good. An alternative reason that yellow perch could survive better in years of high runoff is that the lake is more turbid. So those baby yellow perch then are not eaten as much by predators. And it turns out that it's more the predation, evidence suggests that it's, it's the predation mechanism that is allowing yellow perch to survive better than the more food available. So again, just a fascinating area of research down at Ohio State showing the complicated effects of 
that runoff of climate and how it, you have to follow the ecology to understand the effects on fish. And just to follow up very quickly on that, I live on the west shore, shallow water, Lake Michigan, Illinois. Um, and do, do all these dynamics change whether you're on the west shore or the east shore? Yes. <laughs> okay. One last question. <laughs> you mentioned some of the dangers of Asian carp. To what extent is the Lake Michigan fishing industry concerned about this species? So the gentleman asked, to what extent is the is the fishing industry concerned about Asian carp? And I wouldn't want to speak for the fishing industry on that. Um, in fact, I'm kind of worried what I said earlier about Asian carp might not have been a good idea. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, I think all of us have a concern about Asian carp to, at some level because we don't necessarily know how invasive spe or non-native species are going to react to novel environments. And so um, I think the fishing industry in general is concerned about um, sustainability long term for the fisheries given invasive species and to add another wild card to that like Asian carp I'm sure that's not something they're excited about but it's not something I can really speak to them uh, speak for them directly so. thank you very much for coming and speaking with us today